Good afternoon, and today we are going to talk to Professor Shinedu Okeke, yes. a professor, a researcher, and academic head in the Department of Childhood Education. Yes. Welcome, Prof. Thank you. And then, Prof, can you share with us how did you become a researcher? You know, it's a long story, but uh, let me pick it from when I was at the University of North London in England. At, um, then it used to be called the University of North London. Now it's called the London Metropolitan University. Um, before, before, before that travel from Nigeria to London, I, I was coming from a deeply quantitative um, research background. But, but at that university, I was exposed to the other side of the research coin, which is the qualitative. And then I, I took a, a lot of modules that talked to the research and came to love to be a, a, not just a researcher, but also a qualitative researcher. And then I've written quite a couple of uh, papers trying to encourage uh, researchers, especially within the, uh, the West African Research Balance, to, to join me in um, promoting the qualitative research approach. And then at the end of that program, I, I did a research using the qualitative research approach to, to explore the parental involvement in the, in the management of schools at that level. And then the outcome was huge, that uh, I thought of, I began my PhD uh, also at the uh, London South Bank University. But at some point, I had to stop the PhD because I, I thought of going home to Nigeria to promote the use of qualitative research approach to doing research. Because I thought personally that instead of the strongly agreed, strongly disagreed, uh, no comment, no option, that it is better to explore from the subjective part of human understanding of a particular phenomenon. And then I thought that using the focus group discussion, using the, the semi-structured or unstructured uh, in-depth interviewing, and then using the diary approach, it's not a very popular approach, but uh, I, I demonstrated that during that PhD at the University of Nigeria, uh, in Osaka, Nigeria. And then took up that PhD in 2004 as the best graduating student. And that empowered me, oh, that I could actually make a living doing research. And since then, originally because that PhD was in sociology of education. But by 2012, when I, when I was at the University of of Fort Hare in East London, I realized that I wasn't really doing uh, sociology of education, but early childhood. And then, when, when the post of the early childhood research niche leader was advertised at that university, I, I took a chance and then was appointed. And from that year, I realized that research, meaningful research, actually, should start from the early years. And I've seen myself doing research on how kids grow to learn and how parents get involved in their learning and the capacitation of the practitioners themselves. I, I just uh, completed um, a field work because I just completed a PhD in, in early childhood just this year. And why did I do that? From 2012, I see, as I see myself producing manuscripts and research and articles in early childhood, but my PhD is in sociology of education. I have graduated PhD doctoral candidates in early childhood, and I have graduated masters in early childhood, 
I've graduated honors in early childhood, but my PhD is in sociology. I said, no, something is not complete in my career. And so I took up that PhD last year, and I just finished it. I'm waiting for graduation. And so going deeper into research, I found out that vision, if I take it to vision uh, 20, a third time I it's not going to be complete if we don't go back to the basis to try to understand what is happening at that level. I thought is the most important for me. And then I've been going around communities, disadvantaged communities within the Free State province. In Bethlehem, I, I'm struggling to forget the, the, the experience that I had having to visit an ECD center that was meant for zero to four, where I met a nine-year-old who was sitting in that class. This is very important to me, and I'm very happy right now that I'm speaking about it, because I'm actually thinking of how to get to the VC's office to see how can we make vision a 30, is it? 130. 130, sorry. How can we make that vision to be most visible within the rural places? I was listening to the Vice Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg two days ago, and he spoke about how the university went to Mpumalanga, went to, went to Limpopo and Mpumalanga to establish um, a special schools where those who, without such intervention, wouldn't go to school, are now being educated, being given opportunity to be trained. And they are catered for by the University of Johannesburg. And I said to myself, is it possible that the University of the Free State can do the similar thing? Can we go to that community where I met Nine years old in in classroom, mobile classroom meant for zero to four, because there are no schools within their area that they can go to. You see what I mean? Yes. So researching coming deeply into early childhood is to is to see how I can help bridge that gap in research. Because it's very important that we understand what is happening at the early years. And South Africa and, and uh, the Free State province in particular offers a good opportunity for us to embrace that. Thank you so much, Prof. And then, Prof, what are you currently working on? At the moment, I'm working on two, on, on two fronts of uh, early childhood. Research. One is the, you know, each time we talk about uh, the sustainability of early childhood sector. For me, without capacitating the teaching workforce, which, which are the practitioners themselves or the facilitators as well, then we aren't able to achieve that goal of sustainability because. You know, irrespective of where the center is based, what is most important for me is the availability of qualified teaching workforce, such that if, for instance, this university is able to develop that cohort or, the, or that category of teaching workforce, even if they are sent to the most disadvantaged communities, of, of, the, of the free state province, they still would make a difference in the lives of those little ones. And so, that is the research I'm doing right now, to see what are the training and professional development needs of this set of teaching workforce, the practitioners. What are the, and I was able to interview about 211 of them. I worked personally with them. I visited the communities of 
and to the rural communities of Bloemfontein, of Basabelo, of Tabanchu, of, of a lady brand, and the other one, Devastop, am I right? Yes. And then I found for myself, firsthand, what these practitioners are going through. I'm still busy writing my report, but the good side is that Jota, Jota Publishers, they visited me, sometimes someone introduced me to them, and then they visited my office, and they want me to develop you know, a workbook and textbook for this cohort of teachers, of practitioners. And they are going to commission it, and I'm going to write it for them. To produce a manual, a kind of manual, a textbook, that will capture comprehensively the, the professional and training, okay, the professional development needs and training skills of this, of this uh, workforce, so that at the end of the day, they will be properly equipped. But how will that happen? They can't just buy the textbook and read. They want to come to institutions to learn, even if short learning programs. But they want to learn something. And I see this university being positioned to do that. The good thing is that the Faculty of Education, in the hands of the able Professor Lois Ojita, is doing a marvelous job to see how the South Campus could be fully positioned to do this. The second thing that I'm working on right now, um, which is actually a grant-aided research, is that, um, you know, the HCIF, or the HCI Foundation, is based in Cape Town. But they commissioned my research team to, to, to you know, assess or evaluate the extent of the implementation of the ECD program. Their mandate is that they have eight strategic goals. And they think that any ECD center in which you find those eight strategic, uh, 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 those eight strategic principles, that a child that goes through such center would experience positive formal schooling. And so what we are doing at the moment is that we are working with all the practitioners in the centers where they are, where they finance, to test the hypothesis. Could this be true? And how are we doing that? At this stage, we are still interviewing the practitioners and, and giving them questionnaire to complete. But we are going to go to the schools. We are, we are going to track the primary schools where the, where their graduates go, where the children go for their grade R and grade one. And then we're going to give the teachers in those schools what we have designed as a tool, we call it a performer. They will have to feel the performer. There will be control group, and there will be the actual group where those who pass through all the centers that the HCIF is, is financing, and those learners who did not go through it. And then we want to see what, what, are, the, what, are, the, what are the differences what are, what are the comparative, you know, stuff? That's what we're doing at the moment. Thank you so much. Prof. And I'm loving it. Thank you so much, Prof. And then, Prof, uh, coming to the Vision 130 mm -hmm. on academic excellence, quality, and impact, what role can uh, the early childhood education play in advancing your knowledge? Well, the first thing is that anyone that takes up the job of being a lecturer in early childhood will have to embrace the philosophy of lifelong learning. When you stop learning, you stop knowing. The team, the staff, the lecturers, the academic staff themselves, will have to be properly equipped. The equipment I'm talking about is not waiting for the vice chancellor or the government or for themselves. Yeah. They have to understand the developments in their fields. They have to prepare themselves to enable them to give the quality that, that is required. 
quality will not be assured except the lecturer themselves, him or her, is able to achieve quality for him or herself. This person will be one who loves to do research. This person will be one who loves to share the outcome of his or her research or their research to the, to the general public through workshop, through symposium, through conferences, and so on, and through publications in conference proceedings and in accredited journals. Now, doing this will, will assure the public, especially the funders of programs, that in that department, the quality, the teaching quality, the staff is there waiting. This is the first part. And then the commitment and the passion to do the job is another thing. We have to have the passion to support the vision of that. We have to be seen working towards that. We have to be transparent in what we do. At the moment, I'm developing a concept paper. Because when you go to the University of Fort Hare, you will see East London, you will see a, a massive building is called the uh, ECD Center for Excellence. I, I, I was actually the author of, of the document. And then we went to uh, the Harvard University in 2014 to, to write the memorandum. And then they came with money. The structure there was built by the Harvard group, the Boston College and the Harvard University. Right now, I'm developing a similar concept paper. Because South Campus is positioned, well positioned, to support Vision One Garden. In the sense that if the concept paper is successfully developed, presented to the various structures, and then supported, the idea is to put up a structure which would be, you know, put up and named ECD Center for Excellence. And we will, we will demonstrate the ideal classroom for children on whom we trust the future of the country and the continent. Also, we're developing the, the, the grade R classroom, the foundation faith classroom, you know, at a section on that campus where we want to see, want people to see, this is what we understand as foundation faith classroom. This is, the, this, this is the mirror that we want everybody to draw from. And then, if we want to make our society and vision wanted a reality from the perspective of ECCE or ECD. Yes. Thank you so much, Prof. And then, Prof, coming to the childhood education, yes. looking at the home background, as an essential part where one will be able to know the orientation of skills, even that one of education, then how can your department play a role in terms of empowering the parents, knowing how to bring about this education to their young ones? That is a very interesting question because uh, on Monday by 11, I will be presenting a proposal to, I'm not sure if I will call the name well, but it's called uh, ASPO. Yeah, it's an insurance company, yes, but they are into early childhood. So I'm going to be presenting a proposal. That proposal, um, uh, you know, I call it a um, um, community mapping based approach to harnessing the, the strengths of parents, of the family. I like to use the family now. Of the family as strategy towards sustainability in early childhood. I sold the, I sold the idea to them I also saw the idea to Oppenheimer Memorial Trust. They are also going to invite me in September. But on Monday, I'm going to be speaking. And why is that important to me? It's important because no matter how strong any policy is, 
educational policy. No matter how strong, no matter how well written the early childhood development policy might be, if the family is not well carried along, it will collapse. And so, currently, we know that there, there are the, you know, that the ECD is facing huge challenge because of the non-participation uh, non or the full participation of the family and the parents and the fathers in particular. So my, our interest, and this is the research we want to do as a department, not as Professor KK and one other person, but as a department, everyone in the department will be involved. We want to see how, you know, through the evidence we will draw from the communities, construct a map of that community towards the sustainability of ECD, of early childhood centers in particular. Because I've been to about 45 centers from February 10, from January 10 to February ending this year. And I didn't see the presence of parents. Instead, I saw the presence of a lot of a lot of taverns. And that is, you know, that was not my problem. My problem was that in each of the taverns that, that I saw, you you know, you kept hearing the bang of music. And then one wonders, are they not aware that those are learning centers around? But when you ask the facilitators, the practitioners, they tell you, they know because their kids are the ones sitting in it. So why, why did they care less about the noise they were generating from those taverns? And that's where research is important. Because you may think they know what they are doing. But research will expose whether they do know really or not. And if they don't know, what intervention are we going to suggest that will help them? Without such research, my friends, the migration from Department of Social Development to Department of Basic Education will collapse. Because at the moment, it will seem that the Department of Basic Education is not ready for the migration of the ECD services from the Department of Social Development to them. Because more problems are now being experienced as centers that were not there when the department, when the DSD was in charge of the, of the, of the, of the social development of the ECD, you know. And so, the parents first, we have to do what in that mapping proposal I call the SWOT analysis. We want to find out their strengths. We want to find out their weaknesses. We want to find out the threats that they have. Then we want, most importantly, we want to find out the opportunities that may be lying, waiting for the researchers to expose them. But we, we have to find a way to make the government to come on board, to make the university too. It won't be, it won't be, it won't be a bad idea. Because I'm coming from a tradition, and, and, you know, I'm from Nigeria originally. In Nigeria, every university has university preschool demonstration preschools, university demonstration primary schools, university demonstration secondary schools. In these schools, they have model schools where kids of every staff in, in a particular university attend and is well maintained and managed by the, each university is part of accreditation. When university does not have it and does not have the, the, the prospect of having it, the accreditation will not come fast. And so, such you give opportunity for the villagers. You understand? Because communities in where a particular university is situated must benefit in one way or another freely. You understand? So the parents themselves will begin to see value. Yes. You understand? But when research is taken to the parents, I mean, I, I, I interviewed 50, 
50 fathers in East London, in rural East London, to understand the constraints they face as they attempt to get involved in the education of their, of their children. And it was, you want to see the verbatim transcripts of what these fathers say. But then research would want to paint fathers from a deficit perspective as fathers who are careless, as fathers who are drunk, as fathers who don't care, as absent fathers. But there are fundamental challenges facing these fathers that I saw in my research, whereby some of these fathers have not been able to translate from being mine workers to having family that they see every day without money in their pockets. Some fathers wouldn't stand that. Anyway, let's, let's, let's stop here because that's another discussion. Thank you so much, Prof. <laughs> and then, Prof, coming to uh, decolonization of the curriculum, in one of your uh, books, you talk about Afrocentricity as a, a research methodology. How does it fit in this decolonization? You know, I visit schools quite a lot. And um, one of the saddest moments that I have observed in schools is that that lack of research understanding that the African child socializes differently from the European child, whereby Piaget, Piaget's child, for instance, cannot be, was not, will never be an African child. Yes. But now my worry is that every day we drum the same doctrine that we received from our professors. I mean, for me, over, over 30, 40 years ago, we still drum it. So, how are we going to come out of this? So that, for instance, when you go to a foundation phase classroom, probably the teacher is white. I'm not trying to say, but I'm trying to say it as I say it. Yes. Or the teacher is black. Or the teacher is colored, and so on and so forth. But also a student who is supposed to be doing honors or whatever in the university. And now, that teacher would want to see the learner, a quiet person, according to Piaget, is a quiet person who receives, who sees, who. But children must be children, yeah. and an African child socializes differently from a European child. For us to reduce the incidences, which when you go to the social department, department of social development, where you pick the social workers. And they are overwhelmed by the number of referrals from, from foundation phase classrooms, by teachers and principals, because that child is behaving abnormally. Because that person who is defining the normality or abnormality of a child is operating from the Eurocentric perspective. If we break it down to the Afrocentric perspective, we now begin to contextualize the child and the child's behavior from within an African, African perspective. Where, for instance, in the family, but then it's a problem because the family is also dying fast. We want to have single fathers or single mothers these days and it's growing every second. And so it's difficult now to conceptualize the family. But let's take it from a, a traditional point of view. You have the mother, you have, you have two adults in the family. Then you have children growing around. And then it's the responsibility of the community to ensure that that child behaves in accordance with the norms 
of that particular society. When a child deviates from such norms, it is the responsibility of the community to make the, the particular community to ensure that that child is brought back to a state of normalcy. But that's not what we are teaching. What we are teaching through various subjects are the, 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 the right of the child and the, and the various phone numbers that the child must put in the head so that if things are going not the way the child wants it in the family, the police or any, any of the law enforcement will be invited. My children will quickly say, oh, don't show me that stick. If you show me the stick again, I'm going to invite the police. Oh, when the police comes, I'm, I'll be so glad because I will, I will pack all your things and make sure you go with the police and I enjoy my life. When we begin to philosophize the African child, the African curriculum from the perspective of African knowledge. Some of the challenges that we have in families, in human beings, in societies will die because at the moment we use, um, um, how do I put it now, a, 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 16, a 16 screwdriver or, or, or spanner to approach a seven, a seven, a seven knot or seven bolt or seven screw. But you want to use 16 screw, 16 spanner for 16 knot. And that is how I see these, these, these various knowledge, whereby <laughs> sociologically, we are not the correct curriculum is not producing an African. What is producing is what you call a transmogrification of person. A half trouser, I'm wearing a trouser now, but if I decide to cut it from here, it is neither a short nor a trouser, because we stop somewhere around here. Yeah. And you cannot describe it as a trouser. And you cannot describe it as a short. So what is it? A half trousered person. Is there any language like that? No. That is the type of knowledge, and at the end of the day, the person leaves the institution of learning emptier than he or she was before going in. So, decolonizing curriculum, again, the starting point will be the philosophy of African knowledge, the philosophy of African education. The philosophy that draws from the indigenous knowledge system. Today, you, 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 you better be a good comedian if you talk about what, what uh, Donald Trump is doing, talk about what uh, Biden is doing, talk about the fight between uh, Elon Musk and, uh, and uh, this other person. But if you become, if you go to theater to tell stories, Folklore. Stories about the tortoise, about the birds, about the elephant, when you go to the Nali Valley kind of stories. Yes. Then you are not a serious person. Because that's not what they want to hear. That's not what people go to theater to bear to watch. They want to go to theater to watch Western based kind of stuff. And the traditional person struggles to gain recognition. Because the curriculum has failed to recognize his, his or her knowledge to start with. I don't know if I'm making any sense. No, you are, Prof. And then, Prof, <clears throat> coming to your work or your writing, what, what perspective of the school of thought is influencing your writing? You know, the greatest challenge that I have faced teaching postgraduate models is having to teach um, uh, not just here at Fort Hare, teaching uh, uh, advanced, advanced theory, whereby from where I sit, I am more susceptible to those theories that draw from the internal dynamics of the individual. For instance, when you read 
the symbolic interactionism theory. When you read phenomenological theory, when you read ethnomethological theory, for me, they are real, but they are foreign. But they are real. But when you start to read from Marxism, when you start to read from critical theory, especially the Marxist, the feminist, you think you are just theorizing. Because society and the structure are always to blame for individual failure. And then I say to my, I say to my students every year that my father had nine of us from one wife. But I was the, the servant in that family of nine. And by the time, and he would always say that the reason why we, we were poor, he was poor and therefore we inherited poverty, was because the white man colonized him. But I said, but there are your contemporaries who are rich. Where were you when they were building their lives? You read through the Protestant ethics. It, it will be in the library here. You see that hard work, you see that success is based on hard work, objective. What do you want to be in life? Hard work, diligence, and faith, whatever you believe in. But now, in Marxism, for instance, it's about how the capitalist society is built upon the ruling ideology and how the ruling ideology permeates through the curriculum of schools to ensure that the status quo is maintained, whereby the rich continue to be richer and the poor continue to be poorer. And that didn't happen in my life. Therefore, coming down to your question, I am operating from the perspective of the individuality of the human and how that individuality can be harnessed and how the environment must be made enabling such that that individuality you know, will be supported in that particular person to get to the level that person will be satisfied having achieved. I draw from uh, Yuri Brunfenbrenner a lot, the bioecosystem theory. I draw from um, James Coleman, the social capital theory. I draw a lot from symbolic interaction. And I think that, fine, society can constitute constraints on how individuals want to live their lives. But the role of the individual is key. The choice theory would want to remind us that we know what we want to do, but we want someone else to take responsibility and blame for your failures. And that's not where I'm coming from. I'm coming from the perspective that as an individual, I have a role to play in how I want to become and what I want to become. And, I, and at the center of it is the necessary discipline that will enable me to become what I want to become. Okay. Thank you so much, Prof. And then, Prof, what message can you share with young aspiring <coughs> researchers? The key message is, 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 in, you know, is for them to develop first to discover their research strength, <clears throat> their research belief. What is it that you want to make contribution to? But how are you going to do this? First, you need to discover what has been done by people who thought like you but who came before you. <clears throat> because without doing that, the gap 
which is the ultimate goal of every research, will not be discovered. So, <coughs> sorry, first, to know your research interest, but to work hard, to be sincere to yourself, to understand your limitations, to understand when you need to embrace the the, the, the collaboration of others, the experienced other, in order to learn, but to define your priorities. What do you want to be in life? How do you want to achieve that? What sacrifices do you, do you think you need to make in order to enable you to achieve that which you want to achieve? To strive to be original at the end of the day. But also to strive to know their background. Because remember that popular, uh, that popular saying that Bob Marley. You see, important for you to know your history. Because if you know your history, then you will know where you are coming from. And then you know where you are going to. If you don't know this, you are lost, you are gone. And then that's a problem. So, it's important for us to keep our background in mind because that will serve as a springboard to move forward. But to have the goal to do things with every sincerity of purpose, that is one thing I will tell you has enabled me to succeed. You know, I, I'm not sure I will knowingly say that I want to do wrong. Because nothing good comes from wrongdoing. Nothing good comes from evil. These are, you know, so many advice you want to give. But the key is to know where your interest is. What are you interested in? What knowledge do you have about that interest? What do you know about what others have discovered about your research interest? How would you know that gaps exist? You need to explore. You need to understand. You need to do it with open mind. You don't say that once you, that yours will be the end of knowledge. Once you achieve that, every other thing you say, you know, you know, comes secondary. But it is you and your knowledge. No, you have to be open minded. Ready to accept new things, accept advice, listen to the experienced other, and learn from him or her or from them. I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, you've answered it, Prof. And then, Prof, apart from research, what are your other interests? Yeah, I like to travel a lot. You know, once I stop traveling, but you know, headship will also con uh, constrain you a lot. But I like I like to I like to travel, but not just to travel because I was bought a flight. Uh, I like to I like to speak at a conference. You know, I came back from Brazil um, on the 16th of September. I went to Liverpool to speak also at a at a conference. And when I come back um, on the 20th or so, by 27th, I'll go to a College of Cape Town to speak at the conference, and then October, I'm going to East London to speak at the Sierra conference. I, I like to do these things because uh, that's the only way you can change the world. That's the only way you can change things, by going with genuine knowledge. Yes. The information I'm sharing right now is the information that I'm receiving from the research that I've done visiting communities around the sustainability of the ECD centers through the capacitation of the teaching workforce and through the, the empowerment of the parent population. Very important. Yes. So that is, that is key actually, traveling. But believe me, I can go hungry, but I want to make sure that I pay for DSTV full bouquet because I want to listen to news, I wake up 
any time to listen to CNN, I must listen to BBC, I must listen to ESCA, sometimes and Sky News. I, I like to know, I like to know what's happening around the world, and I want to, I read a lot. Yes. I, have, I have a lot of books in my, in my office, actually what saved me as a student in the UK, full of distractions, was that I enrolled with the world, um, a book, a world, um, I forgot the actual name now, but it's a world book cloud, yeah. and then they send you books for free, you know, when I, when I was reading on Nelson Mandela, and it says that um, education is the only weapon. That was when I had it first, in 1997. Education is the only weapon with which to fight poverty. And I said, oh, what else am I doing? I know I'm not going to be poor, because education is what I love. I love reading a lot. Even sometimes I love talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Prof. And, and then coming back to uh, Vision 130, yes. it, it, it talks about the maximum societal impact and sustainable relationships. So what's your take on that? Maximum so societal relationship. In, impact. And impact. Yes, what, what other impact are we, am I going to speak? I already told you that I'm actually, even two days ago, I was thinking how to get and sit with Prof. Prof. Peterson, the VC, to try to talk about, because even the funders of that research, by the way, the, the funders first went to the VC's office, and then from the VC's office, they were directed to come to education. And then in education, I was invited to the meeting. That's how I got into the research. And then I built my team. And then the funders will say to me, you know, if you travel around the free state province and you fail to put up a proposal to your university to come to some of the communities to show their presence, then I don't think this research would have achieved all it set out to achieve. They use the word advocacy. I think this university will be taken very seriously by the communities, by the society, by South Africa, if we can show our presence in some of the communities that I have been to. I took, I have, I have video, I, I, I record, you know, with the permission of ethics uh, department and the rest, and uh, the participants themselves, who were taking records. Some of the community, we went to one of them, the weeds were up to this point. And then, we couldn't eat for two days. Because when I came back, I looked at my 12-year-old, and then I had a lot of tears in my eyes. Because I was asking myself, what if those boys I saw are my children? They could have been my children. They could have been yours. And they, they are currently in a state of hopelessness. But remember, they would one day grow into hopeless adults. So it does not matter the height of the prison wall or the, or the number of jail sentences. Crimes will be committed. Because someone will eat. So what are we going to do to prevent that? That's what the funders were asking me. What message are you going to send back to the institution? How are they going to assist to show some presence, even to build community-based schools? This university has a lot of money. I'm, I don't know, but I always say that. I'm not sure how correct. But we can... You know, we can strengthen our relationship with the society by the nature of... Remember, I'm not an insider in the university. I'm just in, within the faculty. So I don't know. I may not know for, for real the things that the university may be doing. So I'm speaking from a layman's viewpoint. But if I want to strengthen my relationship where I come from, you know, I sunk a ball 
in my in my in my village. And then I spent a lot of money to put up over over ten thousand over ten thousand liters gallon up there. And then every month, every month since two thousand and twenty one, I send money to fuel the generator, to pump the water up. It's clean water. I've been in the community. I've, I've uh, drunk the water many times. No issue. And then the community sees that there is a professor in that community who is living somewhere. I don't need... I mean, I was there for a funeral in May. And everybody was, hey, bro, bro. Everybody was embracing me. And I was asking, what if I'm the president of Nigeria? and manage to do all these in every community. How will the society look at me? They would think that I'm a god. Are you with me? So, if only the university can visit such communities, I'm still going to you know, present some workshops about the research and talk about some of these things in a more intellectual way. You know, visit some of these communities and see what are we going to do to ensure that the future of these kids are restored. Because at the moment, they're nowhere. You know, it's something that I don't like to talk about. Because, it, 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 you know, it's, it's uh, touching me. So, you know, I don't, I don't like to discuss it. But to think that this is a powerful university. I started working to come here, to work here in 2008, when Professor uh, Jonathan Jensen was visiting, I started, I started writing to, applying to work here. You won't believe that. Because I rate this university very highly. For us to strengthen and to continue to strengthen our relationship with the, with the society, they have to see reason why we are here. You understand? They have to see reason why we are here. They have to see that without this university, I'm not talking about what the government is doing, I'm talking about what the university will do. Yes. So without them seeing that, you know, we may be doing things, but if it's not impacting their lives, they won't believe we're doing something. Yes. Are you going to use all these things against me? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Prof, uh, for sharing with us. We really appreciate your time. Okay. Yes, I'm waiting. Are we done? Yes, Prof. Okay. What else do you want me to say? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, and um, I appreciate this opportunity. Yes. Especially the opportunity to talk about the research visits in which I met a nine year old or some nine year olds in classroom meant for zero to four. We were four in that, in that trip two males and two females. One of the females and one of the, of the males, the doctor, a postdoc fellow, was not able to eat for two days. I, I struggled to get to my house because what I saw in that community was not good. You understand? You see, crime will not stop. Doesn't matter what Bekitele is saying, without having to catch those souls young. This university can do a you know a presence of the school, a building, a structure, and then invite the Department of Basic Education to, to adopt it, isn't it? Yes. Or we can keep it as a demonstration primary school so that we can give such souls that I saw opportunity. No education, no future. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you.